Patriots Lament right here on KFAR, where for the next hour we are going to be talking about the liberty and other issues that pertain to daily life. And uh, I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining me here in the studio from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. And from Far North Tactical, we have Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And on the phone this morning, we have a very special guest, Lou Rockwell. Good morning, Lou. Good morning. All right, I'm Josh. I'll let you take it away. Well, if anyone doesn't know, this is the Lou Rockwell, uh, founder and president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Um, well, we've talked about him and read many of his articles on air. Uh, if you guys don't go to lourockwell.com every single day, you're hurting yourself. Um, and congratulations, the Mises Institute is celebrating its 30th year this, this month, I believe. Yes, it is their 30th anniversary. Well, so. congratulations. That's awesome. What a fantastic, just a wealth of knowledge from the Mises Institute and all the fellows that are part of that institution. I really appreciate I mean, you guys give that stuff away for free, and that's just, just shows to me how you guys actually care about what you're talking about and what you're trying to teach us and not just trying to make a buck, and I really appreciate that. Well, we're in business to spread ideas. And so that's why we want everything available to everybody in the world who's interested, whether it's great books, great videos, great audios, uh, articles, uh, working papers. There's sort of, as you say, there's a vast amount of stuff on Mises.org. Uh, it's free, and uh, we sell books, too, if somebody wants the physical book as well as versus reading on your, on your computer. But uh, we find people in China and Romania and, and just all over the world in Africa who might not be able to afford uh, the physical book, especially transporting them and so forth, uh, but are able to go to a go to an internet cafe or, or uh, something of that sort, even in very poor countries, and they can read Mises and read Hayek and read Rothbard and Hazlitt and and uh, all the other great economists who who demonstrate why the U.S. is on a very bad path. Indeed, pretty much the whole world these days it's become entirely Keynesian. And uh, we want to fight that. We think of us as the counter Keynesians. And uh, so, yeah, everything everything that we can possibly provide for free, we do provide for free. The um, are you finding the whole world basically? I think has been waking up the last couple of years, and I think a, a big part of that has to go to Dr. Ron Paul. I mean, he's spread the message of liberty and just open so many people's eyes. Are you seeing that from, well, you just mentioned other countries. Are you seeing a, re- a surge in oh, the yes, all, Austin yes. economics and things? Like because of Ron Paul, uh, all, all over the world, I, I just read the other day a, a, an article by Murray Rothbard from 1988 when Ron was uh, the Libertarian Party nominee, and he said, this is a man who's got the, the ability to create a worldwide movement for liberty. He said, like nobody else in, in my lifetime. And, of course, Murray, as usual, was right. And uh, what Ron did, especially in his last two presidential campaigns, and I'm not a big fan of electoral politics or of presidential campaigns or any other kind of campaign, but Ron Paul, all his life, has used his electoral position and his electoral campaigns for education. And so, especially in these last two presidential campaigns, he's awakened millions of people, especially young people, not only in this country, all over the world. When I was in, in, in Brazil... Um, about, uh, let's see, a year ago, uh, young people there told me Ron Paul could run for president of Brazil. He's got, he's got just a huge following there. And we find that in every country. Uh, he's, he really is an international figure. And I would, I would dare say there are far more people in this world who care about Ron Paul than about, say, Barack Obama or Mitt Romney. Yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, speaking of uh, where we just kind of went there with presidential pol- well, any politics... We uh, we here aren't really fans of the political process at all. We think it's uh, we don't agree to give our consent to a, a body of force and violence, which is all all politics is. The state's just violence, point the gun at your neighbor and make him do what you want. But we've been getting a lot of heat. Well, it's interesting. I'll just put it this way: you can come on the radio or talk to people and say that you eat kittens and run over puppies, <laughs> and you steal walkers from little old ladies, and they'll kind of look at you like well, that's not very nice. But if you tell them I refuse to participate, I am not going to vote for evil, not just the lesser two evils. I'm not going to participate in evil. They'll flat out get angry and call you names and. 
call you a demon and how dare you and you got the tar and feathers spawn of satan and all these things and why is well, that i mean are oh, we well, correct well you are correct of course but but everybody's indoctrinated from the earliest days in the government schools in a number of things that the government is wonderful the government protects us from bad businesses the government protects us from shadowy terrorists in pakistan and whatever whatever is the, the most recent thing they're they're saying but the key thing they they say is you must you know, support the system, and you support the system in the most critical way by voting. So it doesn't, uh, uh, and they say it doesn't matter who you vote for, and of course it pretty much doesn't matter who you vote because they're pretty much all the same. You saw the vice presidential debate the other night, I think it was just stark, that these guys have no differences of opinion. Yes, they have rhetorical differences. Yes, they don't like each other. Yes, they have different interest groups who are backing them and stand to get at the trough if, if their party is elected. But in terms of actual policy differences, there are, they all believe in all the wars, they believe in all the welfare, they believe in all the police state, the drones, killing all the people in, uh, overseas, and uh, the, the idea that the president should be able to just arrest anybody on his own, say so in secret, imprison you or kill you um, uh, just on his own in the way of Stalin or Lenin or Hitler. Um, but, of course, since it's America, why it's actually wonderful and democratic. Uh, so, yeah, there people are absolutely shocked because it's sort of a religion for them. Democracy is sort of a religion, although nobody ever justifies or explains democracy. I mean, David Gordon, uh, philosopher David Gordon, talks about this. He always argues that nobody makes an argument for anything these days. But one of the things he said nobody makes an argument for is majority rule. He says, why is it? that the majority should be able to crush the minority. What, what, what is the argument for that? And, of course, there is no argument. It's just pure force, and it's also legitimizing. I mean, the, democracy has been probably one of the things that's helped big government the most ever because, of course, we all believe, well, we are the government. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about the government, they say, well, we, are we going to go to the moon? Are we going to go to Mars? We're going to, we're going to start another war. We're going to tax people. We're going to to uh, uh, throw more people in jail for smoking marijuana, whatever it is, it's always we. Well, it's not we. Uh, the government is a separate entity. Uh, it lives off of us in a parasitical sense. And, of course, it's constantly telling us that in the we in the private world, oh, we're, you know, there's something suspicious about us. You're out for your, you want to help yourself, your family, the things you care about, you naughty person. Whereas we in the government, we care only about the common good. We care about everybody. We care about the national defense. We care about... You know, just helping everyone all around the world. Well, it's a lie, but that's what people are taught to believe. So, and you're supposed to vote for that. But if you, if you start to realize that, just for one thing, your vote doesn't count unless the election is decided by one vote. And that sometimes has happened, by the way, in mayoral elections and, and, and tiny city elections and so forth. But unless the election is decided by one vote, and, and of course you, your state presidential election is always decided by, by huge numbers of votes on the other side. Um, it doesn't, uh, you do, your vote doesn't count, it doesn't matter whether you vote or not. It's also a pain in the neck. It's also sort of the sacrament of the state religion, which I think is why, why, why one shouldn't do it. And it's also giving consent to the system. Yes. And it's giving consent to a system that's fundamentally evil. So, yes, you shouldn't consent. Uh, you have more fun on November 6th. You know, you can do something fun rather than go and wait in a long line in some uh, socialist edifice, public school or otherwise. And, or a uh, church. You're much better off. You're a better person for it. It's one of our few remaining freedoms, the freedom not to vote. Exercise it. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's right. Well, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about, because this is something that we hear a lot, and we've tried our best – I guess, you know, it really comes down to what you said with this religious thing, that people take it so seriously. And we've thought about it and talked it over amongst ourselves and on the radio that I think that part of it is that people don't know what else to do. I mean, everyone knows there's something wrong. No matter what political persuasion you are or whatever, anyone you talk to, is there something wrong? Well, yeah, there's something wrong. Well, what do we do about it? Well, we got to vote. So... I think that it's people just think if you say you're not going to vote or t ask them reconsider yourself voting, they think that you're taking away the last remaining hope. And I think it is. It's like our last remaining hope is to get that good guy in there, which is never going to happen, of course. It's set up not to happen. So what what do we do? I mean, I know that you've written lots of things about what we should do. So could you just talk to us a little bit about what are... 
well, making yourself a peanut butter sandwich is better than going <laughs> to vote. But what are the things that we can do that can actually affect change? Is there anything that we can do to affect change, I guess? Well, first of all, we only have to look at the way they get, you know, the, they they uh, uh, do the elections. Uh, does anybody really think that that electing, um, uh, this, you know, Obama as versus Romney or Romney versus Obama? I mean, people who are serious students. I don't mean just tribal. Some people who are tribal Republicans, they're tribal Democrats. They're for their side, cheer for their side. It's like the, you know, the uh, uh, base, like the World Series or something, or the or the Super Bowl. Um, but they're both football teams, they're both baseball teams, and they're both fundamentally the same thing. Although I hate to compare the wonderful sports of football and baseball to, <laughs> to the government, of course, which is which is uh, a nasty enterprise. So um, they love the elections and they love voting because it directs people's attention and energy into a, uh, a government-approved uh, operation that threatens them not at all. Now, when somebody does actually threaten them, like, say, Ron Paul in this last election, they step on him, and they crush him, and they they steal the votes, and they rig the elections, and uh, there's a lot of very bad stuff that went on, but this is this is what they do. They want to prevent anybody who might actually have a different view from, from coming forward, and they are successful at that. Mm-hmm. So uh, what do you do? Well, I, I, I think you start with the only person that you actually have any control over. We'd like to make, a lot of times have more control over our spouse or our children or whatever. There's only one person you have control over, and that's you. So I'm, I'm just quoting Albert J. Nock, the great, the great libertarian, who was once, once talked to once uh, somebody said, you know, I, I want to try to help the world, save the world. Uh, what do I do? And he said, he said, all you can do for the world is present it with one improved unit. In other words, all you can do is make yourself a better person. And, and from in, in talking in these terms, from in libertarian terms, how do you become a better person? You read. You read, 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 read. This makes you unusual these days, of course. But if you really learn some economics, which, as Mises pointed out, is far too important to be left to the economists, <laughs> if you learn some actual American history, if you learn some actual political philosophy, um, then you're able to see through all the baloney that comes out of Washington, the Keynesian economics, the the uh, welfare state stuff, all the, you know, they, they virtually everything they say is a lie. Once in a while they don't tell a lie. I think it's a mistake. But, <laughs> but virtually you're, you're, you're always better off with the government and believing the opposite of what they say, and you'll be virtually always correct. But again, you to, to put yourself one up above the people in the government and to make yourself a figure of authority for others, people will come to you, is to learn. Teach yourself, and you can't, unfortunately, depend on, you know, obviously what's in the public schools or, for that matter, most colleges and universities. You have to educate yourself. You have to read. And uh, I've got a lot of great bibliographies on LouRockwell.com, and I'm glad to give anybody suggestions about books if they're interested. But uh, all the vast number of books for free on, on Mises Org, uh, or get them on Amazon or, or whatever if you want them in your own home, which I certainly approve of, too. Uh, but you you have to learn some economics. I mean, just if you read just one book, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, which is a one of the great classics, was published in the late 1940s. But when you read it, he might as well be talking about today because all the arguments that he's refuting are the same ones being advanced. If you read that one book, and it's so well written, H. L. Mencken once referred to Hazlitt as the only economist who can really write, <laughs> and he can really write. Uh, he's been passed away for some years, like Mencken passed away for some years, but his book lives, his books live on, his many, many great books. But if you start with this book, which is for lay people, it's not for, not for, uh, uh, not for professional economists or people who want to become a pro- professional economist. It's for, it's so that you will know something about what the government is doing to you, so you can explain it to others, but most important, so you know yourself, you can see through the fog generation machine of the media and the government all the lies they tell, all the stuff about, you know, that Bernanke says, and stimulus, and QE, and and uh, the deficits, and the spend, Social Security, and all this stuff, you will understand it better than virtually anybody else you listen to or, or, or meet. And uh, so that, just read that one book, you're doing something something great for yourself and for for your whole society instead of going to waste your time uh and maybe have your bo- your vote uh, miscounted by some hacking mechanism at the uh, polling place 
We've um, we've pushed pushed Richard Mayberry's books pretty hard, especially whatever happened to Justice. Yeah. That seems to be a, even though it's uh, written for a, a younger crowd, it's it's done wonders for a lot of people that I know personally. Yeah, his books are wonderful, and also his Penny Candy books, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, Mayberry's a very talented guy. Yeah, he was a guest with us here a few months back. It was uh, he is, and we've also been. Uh, recommending people join uh, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom just a fantastic I mean there's no excuse anymore not to know what's going on not to learn economics not to learn American history world history you can download it listen to it in your car as he says on his ad I mean there's just a volumes wealth of knowledge that you guys put out and there's so many things that they could people could do to enrich their lives I mean that's really what you're you're just offering them some way to enrich their own lives. Well, you know, if you take a guy like Tom Woods, and he has a great website, TomWoods.com, um, he's one of the great teachers ever. So, you know, the, the, um, there's that wonderful uh, um, scene when Ben Stein is a teacher in... Uh, Ferris uh, Bueller. Ferris Bueller. <laughs> and he's talking on and on. And when you look at the kids, the great shots of kids just going, losing their minds in boredom. I mean, it's just a hilarious scene, and it's just, as Gary Norr said, it symbolizes everything about the public schools that I've seen. Um, but Tom Woods is the opposite of that. Tom Woods, you listen to Tom Woods, you think, geez, I wish I could go back to school and take a course from this guy. But you can go back to school and take a course from this guy. And there, he's so interesting and so knowledgeable, so fun, uh, so motivating. Um, so, yeah, Tom Woods is Liberty Classroom, and I'll mention... Uh, uh, Mises Academy, which is all kinds of online courses as well from uh, Mises.org. So yeah, there's more and more ways to get around the, the standard system, which is either teaching uh, you lies or teaching distortions or uh, teaching you stuff that uh, is, is entirely irrelevant to your life. So yeah, the private sector is is coming on strong, and absolutely, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom is a great a great thing. What um. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, Lou, I, this is Steve Floyd. I, I host a show Hi, during, during the week, and uh, I get an awful lot of calls from people who get very angry that we talk about not voting because they feel as if they've been forced into this false choice where either they go out and vote or they take up arms and start killing people. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to tell them, look, no, you don't have to kill anybody. In fact, <laughs> uh, we advise you not to do any violence to, to anyone, anywhere. It's not, that's not part of our, our makeup here. That's not what we're advocating. Who, well, is ad, who is advocating it? Where is, that, where is that idea coming from, that somehow we have to take up arms in order to make a change? Uh, I think that comes from Obama and Romney, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, aren't they the ones always advocating war to make change? Aren't they the ones who take up arms against anybody who... You know, this is the bunch that claims the right to kill you if you sufficiently resist paying your library fine. <laughs> right. Nice. Yeah. They're the violent ones. You know, so yes, there are violent, there are private criminals, but they're nothing like the public criminals. So absolutely, that, that's the, that's the, that's the government's mode of operation, killing people. Uh, that's not the that's not our mode of operation. And uh, you, the government's you... got most of the guns. They've got the uh, atom bombs and so right. forth. Our battlefield is ideas. Uh, but not voting is a very important idea. So don't get roped into the nonsense that somehow voting for one crook versus another crook is going to improve your life. Tell me when that's happened. <laughs> it hasn't. It won't. <laughs> the, uh, it was, I think it was John Adams that uh, said that the revolution was won way before the actual fight started it was one with the hearts and minds of the people years before and you can see that in history it was the changing of the people's hearts and minds is what made the revolution it wasn't the actual shoveling up the muskets and pulling the trigger it was a great a great uh, french lawyer uh, Etienne de la Boetie, in the 16th century mm. who wrote a very important paper and if you if you were to go to lourockwell.com and put in b o e t i e and then Rothbard, uh, R-O-T-H-B-A-R-D. Murray Rothbard is a great introduction to this important essay. But he he says all the political thinkers uh, of his time are always wondering, uh, how do we make sure that everybody obeys the king? And uh, De La Buetti said, you know, my question is, why the heck does anybody obey the king? Isn't that the actual mystery, the, mi- the mystery of political obedience? He said, he said, why is it? Because, of course, necessarily... 
And this is true even today, as big as the government is today. Of course, we have the biggest, richest, most powerful government in the history of the world that we live under today, the U.S. government. But it still is a minority. They can't, they have to be a minority, otherwise they can't live it up off the rest of us. If the if the parasite gets too big, it kills the host. So uh, the government is always a minority, uh, said Dilabwadi. Uh, people, um, if they just stop obeying it, the thing collapses on it in of itself because it requires consent. It requires at least implicit consent. So every government that is in existence, whether it's Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, or whatever, uh, if if it has it has the consent of the it has the consent of the governed. American government has the consent of the governed. Not, not everybody actively consents. Not everybody's cheering on cheering on the, um, the latest things the government is doing. But they're at least not opposing it. They're thinking, well, you know, we're stuck with it. Well, to the extent that people don't adopt that attitude, to the extent that people free themselves mentally, which is the first thing you have to do, so you don't consent to what they're doing, and uh, you educate yourself, and you and you understand that you don't have to go along, you don't have to be part of the uh, of the gang, gang of thieves and killers located in Washington D.C. telling us they're superior to us, by the way. And of course, they also make far more money than we do. You know, the hmm. the uh, typical government employee at all levels. This is not only federal level, but state and, and local level makes double what the average taxpayer makes. And this, and of course, at the same time, they're all saying, "Oh, they're underpaid. The poor school teachers. They're not making any money." It's all a lie. So they're all doing very well. They have, of course, pensions and benefits that uh, are unheard of this side of heaven, um, and uh, they're living it up at our expense. So the first thing you have to do is not salam them, not salute them, not uh, not uh, bow down to them, and resist them internally and mentally. And that is the beginning of that's the beginning of a change. Uh, and it's not violent. They've got the guns anyway. We're not. None of us are interested in violence. That's as again, as I say, that's the government's mo. That's not the mo of uh, the people who believe in freedom and liberty and not aggression. Because what is libertarianism? If you just put it in a nutshell, it's the view that we don't think that it's ever ever morally justified to use violence or the threat of violence against the innocent. Mm. Now, when you say that to somebody, they think, well, of course that's right. But of course. Most people are happy to do that. They whether to collect taxes or bomb people in uh, uh, in a wedding party in Afghanistan or, or and everything else in between to uh, uh, eminent domain, uh, grab some guy's piece of property. Uh, it's all the government's one tool. The one you know, if you've only, if you've only got a hammer, everything's a nail. Well, all they've got is the gun. <laughs> that's that's their uh, and we're all the targets. And flashbang so, grenades um, too. <laughs> yeah. So we that's their 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 that's their shtick. That's not ours. And so I think we always have to be nonviolent. That's our basic principle. We don't want violence. The only time violence is ever justified is in defense. It is never justified in offense. And that's true. And again, we also say as libertarians that the moral law applies to everyone. Just because somebody's in a government suit or getting a government check makes that doesn't make them exempt from the moral law. So the things that are wrong for you and I to do in our private lives are also wrong for the government to do. Uh, and just because the government doesn't give them the right to break the moral law. But of course, uh, when Machiavelli first said, hey, the government can break the moral law, the prince can break the moral law, everybody was horrified. I thought, well, that's you know evil and ridiculous. Now, because of democracy, mm-hmm. everybody says, oh, well, that's right. Of course, the government does have, the cops have the right to speed. The cop, you know, every the government has the right to do all kinds of things that in the private sector would be considered theft or murder or kidnapping. Uh, but when they call it the draft or they call it taxation or they call it capital punishment or war or whatever, then of course it's okay. Hey, go to it, boys. Uh, so libertarians say, ah, well, if it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. And just because you're the government doesn't give you some kind of God-given right to do evil. Mm-hmm. Nice. I know we're getting pretty close to the end. I wondered uh, if you could speak. How much time do we have? We have about a minute. Oh, a minute? All right. Probably not enough time then. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to say? I was going to ask you about uh, a quick what you think of uh, anarcho-capitalism and what the theory behind that is, but I know we're getting close to the end here. So anything else you'd like to leave us with? Well, I just mentioned that was Murray Rothbard's phrase, and he wanted to distinguish... Uh, people who didn't, who uh, anarchy comes from the Greek, having no 
no superior, no, no state over you, no, no, no boss over you, that you exercise self-government in a sense. So, um, but there are a lot of people who call themselves anarchists who are actually communists. I mean, they believe in uh, no private property, and uh, they, they tend to be very bad people. And they believe in, you know, we, we see the riots and they uh, breaking the Starbucks window and that sort of thing. That's, of course, entirely unlibertarian. It's a criminal act. So uh, Murray said, uh, libertarians are anarcho-capitalists. We believe in the free market. We believe in the capitalist system. We believe in private property. Uh, along with the fact that you may not aggress against the innocent. I mean, never initiate violence or the threat of violence against the innocent. Lou Rockwell, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate Balance. it. Thank you, gentlemen. Fox. Thank you. And welcome back to the program right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we are streaming live online at KFAR660.com. And you can also find us on your smartphone with the TuneIn radio app. You just go to the local radio section and you'll find us there. And uh, you know what, uh, Josh, I really appreciate you hooking up, uh, getting Lou Rockwell on the air this morning. He, he had a, a way I had of, help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a way of putting things that were really um, salient, I think, to our, our discussions that we've been having. You know, that, that issue, what he just said about uh, La Boite, uh, mm-hmm. just going back and looking it up and looking at some of the things that Rothbard said, it was a medieval tradition to justify tyranny of unjust rulers who break the divine law. In other words, it was to justify killing them. And, you know, look, you broke the law, we're going to kill them, but... Labwati's doctrine, nonviolent, was in the deepest sense far more radical. Here's what Labwati said, quote, Resolve to serve no more, and you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, fall of his own weight, and break in pieces. I know you've read that before on the air, but it just it seems like... You know, people are all concerned about the the random stops by the police. They're concerned about the, uh, the the different laws that have been enacted. They're concerned about Obama and Romney. Well, what if we just paid them no attention? There would be, uh, let's see, Romney's wife, Obama his wife, vice president. Oh, Romney would win because uh, I think that Biden's wife passed away, so it would be three against four, and he'd have a mandate. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, absolutely. The other, earlier in that, uh, what De La Boete wrote, and that's from 1552, I believe, that he wrote this, which is fascinating. But his whole argument in this whole thesis that he wrote is why is it that a man with two arms and two legs, no different than yourself, has this power over you. He ha- he doesn't have it, actually. That That's the whole, that's what his premise is. He does not have this power over you, except for that you've given it to him. If you simply walk away from it, it's over. We just can't internalize it. It's, we think that it's so huge now. You know, the government is so huge, and it is. Like Lou Rockwell just pointed out, there's still a great minority I don't know how many people are in government, but they're still the huge minority. We have 300 and some odd million people in this country. We're the majority. Yeah, look at China. How much more of a majority did they have over their far more tyrannical government? Yeah. This is ridiculous. They have uh, they're three to one compared to Americans, and I don't think their government's as big as ours, is it? No. <laughs> and they allow, their government isn't as big as ours. And they allow much more tyranny. And they're communists. And we're, oh. oh, yeah. So I wanted to thank Jim from Kenai, who's called him before, who actually got this uh, interview with Mr. Rock, Rockwell put together, and also Natalie Howard, who sponsored this hour of the show with cash money. Nice. Put oh, your money where your mouth is. Yeah, we want to did, thank did both you, of them. Did you open up the phone lines? Or? I the, the phone lines are open right now. 458-TALK is the number if you'd like to call in and react to what you heard from Lou Rockwell. I think we're all just, like, still stunned here. Because I am. I'm just... Well, it, you know what? It, it's nice man. to hear someone who can articulate some of the things that I feel mm-hmm. in, in terms of uh, trying to explain to someone why it is that I am choosing not to participate in the voting issue. I, I'm still... I'm, I'm People were absolutely befuddled. At, or or they're so... You know, they, they, they adopt this... Um, this slight shaking of the head and, and this condescending tone. I'm so disappointed to hear that, Steve. 
I'm so disappointed to hear that. Maybe it's because Lou Rockwell doesn't know that Mitt Romney is George Washington incarnate. Yeah. I think he probably doesn't listen to Glenn Beck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just step out on a little tiny tree limb there and think well, that. But. Well, I did find out that he's not only George Washington incarnate, he's also John Galt. Oh, is he now? Is yes. he John Galt, too? He's John Galt, too. So, actually, that would make a lot of sense because we've always asked, who is John Galt? And I think that oh, wait a we've second. heard John, for the last John Galt years. never required anybody to buy medical insurance. <laughs> That's true. But for the last well, six or did seven Romney. years, it we've been asking. In Massachusetts, he did. It was voted did. Oh, okay. But haven't we been asking who's Mitt Romney for the last five or six years, too? <laughs> what is a Mitt Romney? <laughs> I, you know, to, to look at the, I, I loved the illustration he gave of sports in there, not not to denigrate the sports at all, but yeah, but was, what what difference does it make if you go to a game and cheer for your side? Can you have any impact at all on what happens on the field? No. Absolutely, you can. Oh. If if you have if you get enough people in the crowd, you really can. You can you can unnerve the other team. I've seen it happen. The effect of the crowd on the team, hmm. but. And you can't, you, you don't actually win. Those in the crowd aren't the winners. Those in the crowd, I mean, you can affect what happens on the field, but you can't, you don't win. The team still. Uh, it is the team. And and you look at right now, who are the teams that are playing? You don't, you can't get your own team together. You can't go out there and, and you know, you get a, an independent guy like, um, who's that guy, Ron Paul, whoever that is. Uh, I mean, yeah. he's already fading from the public consciousness. The whack job. Because it, when he, he, you know, trying to get his team onto the field, they were basically harassed. They were prevented from doing it. And then when you actually get you actually get a team on the field, and you think about it, if you got some guys around from Fairbanks and put them on a football field against some the Green Bay Packers, what would happen? Smash. What would happen? <laughs> I, I, mean, I think any, Green Bay would win. I haven't seen what they got going on this year, but pretty sure. Right. We've got three lines on hold now. Would you like to go to the phones, Josh? Yeah, let's do it. 458 Talk is the number. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? It's Natalie. Natalie, thanks for calling in. Hey, I I wanted to call in um, and and talk a little bit more about Lou Rockwell because I just, it was so nice to hear somebody articulate, like you were saying, the arguments that he made or or, or speak. And that Laporte essay that uh, Rothbard wrote an introduction for is, is just one of my favorites. It's really something. It's available online. I think it's something everybody should read. But in, anyway, I, I wanted to say that I met Lou Rockwell in person this past summer when I was at the Mises University, and I when it was able to talk to him and just and just to understand the way he gets his points across and and his his even his physical demeanor. He is just a humble um, wealth of knowledge, and I think that um, you know you, it comes across on the radio, but just an in, a, a person that um, has a lot to offer, and, and the way that he puts his ideas across um, is effective and something I think we could all all use a little bit of, is maybe as a mentor, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, he was he was so gracious to Ron Paul about you know what he, his comments about Ron Paul, but I mean he he shouldn't. We shall realize that I mean he he really is behind. 30 years of, it, of advancing liberty at the Mises Institute yep. and what that university has done. And we don't hear a whole lot about it in this country. Maybe we're starting to more and more, but it, this is worldwide. I mean, when, when I went to the Mises in, uh, Institute this summer, the majority of the people at the conference were international. So, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it was about a third American. Yeah. Just in the small group I hung out with, um, one of the... the the men I hung out with it was a Kurd from Iraq, and um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. I really wanted to ask him about um, Ron Paul's followers versus Ron Paul's stances. Um, people advocating for the same. I mean, really, the people that support him, by and large, not all of them, are after the same thing that the Romneys and Obama supporters are after. Yeah, there is. It's yeah. unfortunate. Um, that, I mean, Ron Paul's message, it, I I personally think the trade-off's worth it. He definitely wakes up enough people to counter uh, counteract what the people that are supporting him are after. But they're still looking for a master to fix all of their problems. Right. I just, Which I, he never 
I wish we would have had more time to. I just wanted to put that question to him. Of course, Ron Paul doesn't advocate that. Oh, well, we're going to have Ron Paul on sometime, anyways. I'm sure that'll be like the epitome and end of our show. But doesn't, hopefully, I mean, doesn't that idea of voting for somebody to make it all right doesn't that come from people's unwillingness to take personal responsibility for their own actions? Sure, it does. But I think it's a little deeper. I think that it's uh, desperation. We're a desperate people. I really believe that deep. I I've internalized that to myself that we're a desperate nation. Um, I mean, like the word nation. The American people are desperate for hope. I mean, that's why Obama got elected. There's no other way around it. Obama got elected because of the hope and change. They really thought there was going to be something different. And Ron Paul, there was a lot of people that looked at, okay, here's the hope. And I think that a lot of them didn't internalize what his message actually was. It was liberty. It was not the political process. But we've internalized that the political process is our only chance to have hope, which is really sad because they vote over and over and over hoping for that change. And yet their hope is dashed and crashed. I mean, no matter which side you vote for, look at how many people are disappointed with Bush. Look at how many supporters of Obama are disappointed in him. It's a, it's a false hope. There is no hope in that process. Well, even on the local level, I mean, you look at the votes that we've been having at the borough. I mean, you look at this utility issue and the, yeah. uh, you know, Natalie, you, 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 I mean, I was not surprised at all to see that the vote was six to two with only no. only you and Michael Dukes voting against it. And, of course, Matt Want wasn't there. Yeah, that, that was, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty rough night. And it was a rough night for economics and, and liberty and um, and truth. But I wanted to go back a little bit to what Aaron was asking because when you see, and I, and I don't want to put words in Mr. Rockwell's mouth or, or anticipate what he said, but when you watched him at the Mises Institute with people who may have been, you know, Ron Paul, but still not been thinking it through or, or reading a lot of economics, he approached everybody the same, and he, in a, in a, <clears throat> a very gracious way, and he didn't make anybody feel like they were lesser because they hadn't read, you know, all of Rothbard's work. Or, uh, you know, there was a ki- there's a kindness and an even keelness about him that's not accusatory. He's definitely a gentleman among gentlemen. I mean, just oh. listening to his podcast and stuff. I've never met him, but he is, that's the kind of people we need right there. Yeah, and, and I think that when people, the, the great thing about people being attracted to the Ron Paul movement, whatever stage of personal development they're in, is that, you know, that's the thing. He said he nailed it this, this first half hour. If you start reading yourself and, and whether you, know, you consider it reading or a type of self-reflection or a type of going beyond just the, the vote and the immediate, oh, my gosh, I'm aware that there's a problem, and you start to go into, you know, what are the economics of it, then you can see right through all the garbage, and that's bringing it back Thursday night. The gas utility was brought about because they said we don't have to pay taxes, which means that it should be frightening to everybody because that means that the government has, it is to the point at which they will exercise the force of the power they have to make anybody that they are in competition with now just not economical. Yeah, they can get loans from the state where private industry can't, which they shouldn't. Yeah. But at the same time, neither should the borough. The state shouldn't be well, in the business of loaning and borrowing money in the first place. The state shouldn't be in the business of exactly. direct competition with, um, you know, this deal that was in with private industry, this deal that was in the paper there where a few of us were writing comments and people are just so not smart. I mean, people are <laughs> like, well, why – I wrote something about the reason that uh, we have high prices, and I truly believe this, is because of government monopolies. And one of the gals, or I assume because her name was NYC Lady, but she wrote, what monopolies are you talking about? There's no monopolies here in town. There's no monopoly at Flint Hills and at GVEA. But yes, there is. Go try to build yourself Mm -hmm. a fuel refinery. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You can't do it. They have the monopoly, and it's a government-induced monopoly. Try to get another... Utility start, uh, electrical utility started. It isn't going to happen. 
GVA has that monopoly by the government. They even pose that monopoly. And the only reason we don't have gas is because of government monopolies and regulations imposed on us. They impose those things on us to our direct, not our benefit, but our direct uh, demise. demise. And yet, so who do we look to to turn that around? The same people that impose it on us in the first place. Well, and, and that won't happen. It won't change until, like what Lou Rockwell said, the lady NYC needs to either read or something in her has to click where she says, hey, I need some more knowledge or I need to reflect on this or I need to understand economics. Economics isn't just an academic subject. It, it, it's, a, it's an everyday life of human behavior that you understand a lot more about yourself. And until people start that investigative process on their own for themselves, it, it's, it, you can't hardly have the conversation. Yep. Yeah, it's a, and, uh, it's definitely and, a self-education, like we talked about with the, the revolutions are mind. That's why I think it's important. I mean, if you don't want to do it, that's fine, but people that understand these things need to write in the blogs. They need to write on the newspapers. We need to talk to people. We need to have radio shows. We need to expose the truth. That's how we win. Eventually, we don't need to have it happen tomorrow, which is why so many people vote, I think. One of the reasons is I need to change now. Right. They want to affect immediate change. Immediate change. I need something to happen tomorrow because I can't pay for this or I can't buy my fuel. I need this. I need that. And I think that answers Steve's question from earlier that he asked Rockwell was uh, why do people resort immediately to the gun? They need a me- they, they need immediate change. They want to affect immediate change. And um, well, isn't that the same argument though that was used to advance this this utility? Right. It's we an have emergency. To do it we now. need gas now. Right. We can't wait for the private sector. And the, if you if you really get down, <laughs> we're the private sector. Yeah. <laughs> if you get right down to it though, if um if you don't start with the hearts and minds, you end up with the same thing on the other side. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's put it into uh, theoretical here. Let's say. America had an economic collapse, <gasps> and let's say <laughs> that would that would obviously be very bad. I mean, on everybody, uh, security would immediately go out the window, right? Mm-hmm. So, wouldn't everybody recognize the uh, the problem at hand? Um, they would think to themselves, "Well, government fell, so that's why we're in this fix." Even if they were to pull out guns, shoot every direction. To try and affect change, wouldn't they want to put government back in because government going out was the reason for their woes? Hmm. And getting government back in would be obviously what would be the stabilizer, so not, they would have something worse on the other side. Not understanding that the government was what made the conditions happen for itself to fail and the economy to fail. I, I guess need, what I'm well, we hear at, that here. Guys call up and they say, well, if we have a collapse, first thing we need to do is we've got to find a good guy to lead us again. <laughs> sure, but, I mean, even uh, a, little, vote for a little kid would um, <laughs> immediately see that the cause of the problem would be collapse of government, so the best way to fix the problem would be to institute government. more powerful, the better, to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm-hmm. I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm just making an appeal to, um, of course, everybody knows I own a gun store, so I get the the most savory of people come in, and they have the best intentions, but their thought process is to get to the the end state, which is to shoot their way to liberty. And I, I just want to challenge all those guys that have that thought process that wouldn't they institute something more oppressive on the other side because the very problem they're fighting becomes their answer? So our real battle is with the minds, isn't it? If we don't change hearts and minds, we're wasting our time anyway. Your gun is worthless. Well, I, I would look at it another way just to add to it. I would look at it as two things. One is that somebody once asked me, would I, would I vote for myself? It's like on a, on a local election. And, mm-hmm. and I actually thought about it, and I said, well, I, I, it would, what the system is today, I don't think I really in good conscience could because I'm not infallible. I mean, I'm, people make mistakes. But you're the you know, lesser of the evils over there at the borough. <laughs> I, I know. I'm the lesser of the evil, but it's really not. It's really beyond that right now. It's really to the point where um, if the system has, in my opinion, the life of its own, and, and, and that's not going to change it. But you also bring up that wouldn't, you know, what are these, what's the other side going to replace this system with? And what would be worse than even like if you had some type of 
violent revolution was what if these what if the other quote unquote side actually got power via voting? They just continue the same system along. Mm-hmm. It just would be a different shift of power. Same plantation. Right, uh, American mm-hmm. Revolution was uh, pretty unique in that aspect because they had already fought the battle in the hearts mm-hmm. and minds. Whereas the French Revolution, the um, not so much. <laughs> Not so. And, and if we did have a revolution again here, I think we would see something much more like the French Revolution. And, well, sure. And that comes straight from what we just said. I mean, there is no uh, there is no grasping of individual liberty anyway. So how how could you expect to have anything else? Natalie, thanks so much for calling in. Yeah, okay, thanks thank for you sponsoring very much. I've got to go. Lou Rockwell. 458 Talk is the number. We go to our next call. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, guys. What's going on? This is Abe. Abe? Abe, how's it going? Yeah, it's me. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, I uh, I really like what, what Natalie brought up about when she went down to the Mises Institute about, the, um, about who was actually going to it. And she mentioned that it was actually a lot of people from outside the United States. And I think that that shows how... You know, specifically the, the the man that she mentioned from uh, Iraq, and the fact that you know people are coming looking for liberty from from for all technicality more obvious depression than we are, and the way that they're figuring out how to solve their problems is that is that they need to get educated. And I and I really like that that's what Lou hit his hammer on was, you know, the basis of what you do, other than voting, is to go and learn about what how the world really operates through you know. The renew, you know, renewing of your mind. Put that information in there because you can you can run around wanting to solve all kinds of problems all day long, but if you're not reading and you don't, and you're not understanding what what the importance of, you know, exercising your brain. You know, God gave us an amazing brain, this ability to take in tons of information and to see the world for what as it really is. And when we can put that in our brains and and learn to you know learn to function properly, all of a sudden all these answers come. You can actually find the answer for yourself. You don't have to go look to somebody else for an answer. Abe, you could actually probably help me out with a question that I have in my mind. Uh, oh, great. You, Is this a stumper? You've been to Iraq, right? Yeah, actually I have. You went over there as a contractor. And um, so since you've been there, you'd probably be able to help me out with this a little bit. Um, you know, we, Natalie said there was a person, a uh, Kurd from Iraq over there trying mm-hmm. to learn about liberty, which I don't really understand that because we already brought him liberty in the form of demo- <laughs> democracy, didn't we? Oh, man, I saw liberty over there. Liberty, I, I think I had to wear uh, wear body armor whenever I went out into the liberated zone. It was, uh, yeah, liberty, liberty is, uh, if, if us bringing liberty over there is literally us rolling around and patrolling their streets with guns and, you know, and you have women literally wanting to shoot back at our soldiers. Well, we never said we brought them liberty. We said we brought them democracy. Oh, that's true. That's, that is a good point. And hopefully the guys at the Mises Institute sat them down and let them understand that liberty is not for brown people, <laughs> especially in the Middle East. Well, Glenn oh, Beck man. says it's not. Oh, man. I mean, I guess we can go, we can go and look at the uh, Nazi regime for that one, right? Hmm. Well, you can, you can look at right the very brown people as long as they were killing Jews. No, no, you can look at the very roots of our country right here. I mean, slaves couldn't vote, American Indians couldn't vote. I mean, mm-hmm. we went and took away, uh, rounded up as many of the natives as we could and shoved them onto reservations, right? Yeah. So you're saying that um, black people and Indians were the only ones that were free because they didn't vote? <laughs> no, they couldn't vote. They wanted to I, vote. Oh, I see. I, I was just really happy that um, that both Natalie. Uh, plug and uh and, and live themselves i mean they, they hit the nail on the head and, and that's education i know that for my own life i've experienced a, a huge change just in the last probably two or three years in my own thinking based solely on the fact that i started reading you know i i wasn't pumped information from you know from aaron and josh bennett i was pumped information from looking for it myself on you know anywhere i could find it anything that rang true to me and i was like Oh my goodness! This this is truth. This is how things are operating, um, and it and it's and it allowed me to, in my own opinion, obviously think for myself on what what is liberty? Where does it come from? Why is it so important? Why do I want my neighbor to have liberty? You know, I, I mean, it's it's like we. I mean, you, you guys have mentioned several times on several times on your show. I can't have liberty if my neighbor doesn't have liberty, and so the first step that I want is to educate my neighbor. That's why I think it's so important for, you know, your guys' show to keep going. It's important for me to speak to everyone that I know about what my opinions are. And, you know, anyway, 
That's my plug. I I, uh, mm-hmm. I also thought of the uh, Matrix reference, you know, the whole free your mind thing, and 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 basically operating in 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 a system that we all know is flawed and corrupt. But as soon as you can come to the understanding of what liberty is you no longer have to operate in that system. I mean, you can literally say, you know what? I'm not a part of it. I don't give consent to the government anymore. I actually I can begin that, that that movement toward freedom by no longer participating. I knew I'd choose the wrong pill. Dang it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Steve, come on, you went to Bosnia. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. I was happy to stay plugged into the system. All these things coming from a guy that was named after Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, you, know what's, you know what's really funny? I... I, I used to tell all of uh, everyone that I know, you know, oh, yeah, Abe, Abe Lincoln is my seventh cousin. You know, I'm, I'm related to him. And, and the more that I've learned, the more that I've realized, oh, my goodness, during that period in the history of the United States, we changed over from, you know, I mean, obviously there was slavery. There were some things that were going on. But at least the states were individually governing themselves, and there was no massive federal government trying to, you know, become this, this, this powerful each. And, you know, through that namesake, one of the biggest empires in the world was given birth and consult- started to consolidate power and look at what, what we have now immediately went overseas <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we did yeah after the elections here we get, I don't know I've been thinking about taking a big turn and doing some like things like talking having a show on Abraham Lincoln mm-hmm. the, in the party of God mm-hmm. yeah, yeah um, I, I I really enjoy will you call talking. in for that show Abe <laughs> I'll, 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 yeah, of course. I, I like calling just because I like talking. We know. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> hey, thanks All for right, uh, participating with us here this morning. We've got uh, about a minute here before the uh, top of the hour, and time goes by really fast. Yeah. I did. I did want to point out something that Lou had said earlier in terms of uh, educating yourself, joining the Liberty Classroom with mm-hmm. Tom Woods. You can just Google that and uh, sign up uh, free. And you can start participating that way. Also, that book, Economics in One Lesson, is available free. I've actually pulled it up right here right. on the Internet. All you have to do is Google those words, Economics in One Lesson, and you'll find it. Henry Hazlitt. Yeah, and he even uh, plugged uh, Richard Mayberry's uh, Penny Candy and Whatever Happened to Justice. Um, go to the le- go to Mises.org and find all this stuff for free. And uh, LouRockwell.com, just a wealth of knowledge. I go to... I go there every it, day. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to actually read. You're going to have to actually do some work. We're not asking you to go out and carry, do something easy like carry a sign. It doesn't take long, though. I mean, once you start internalizing some of it and understanding it, it's just like, whoa, I want more. we got another hour of live local talk on the way right after the Fox News right here on KFAR. We are online at KFAR660.com and on your smartphone with the TuneIn Radio app. And welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR's local talk radio, but we are streaming live online at KFAR660.com, and we are also found in your pocket if that's where you keep your smartphone, because we are also now on the TuneIn Radio app. Uh, joining us in the studio this morning, I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine from Far North Tactical. We've got Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. And from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. All right, gentlemen. <laughs> that was Aaron. I just speeding up the process. Good morning. Helping things along here a little bit, which of course is you must be government. You're just gonna kind of help us along. We need uh, it now. You just be doing things for our own good. We have opened the phone lines back up at four five eight talk four five eight eight two five five. If you'd like to call in and participate uh, in that particular manner, uh, so Josh. Yeah, I, before I forget, next week we're gonna have on Robert Murphy, another guy from the Mises Institute. I'm really excited about that. We're going to go... On yeah, a pretty... Another guy, i got to go listen to what he talks about. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, private societies with him, which I think is going to be cool. How, you know, People call him and say, well, how would you have... Uh, uh, roads. Roads, and how would you have police protection? They'd only protect you know people that pay them and blah, blah, blah. And so... Didn't we answer that question in our island? Yeah, no, let's guy. not go back to the island, please. <laughs> oh, he wants you to. You see that sick no. smile he did when he no. the island? <laughs> so, yeah, Robert Murphy next week is going to be very good. I think he's going to stay for a whole hour, second hour. So, looking forward to that one. Congratulations to the in, the European Union. Yeah. Wow. Great. Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize winners for, let's see, 
for over six decades contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe, the European Union. Now, if you go to Lou Rockwell's blog, <laughs> it's at the top. And with this little congratulations to the European Union, he's showing a bunch of people's heads getting bashed in by the European Union police. So, yeah, advancement of peace and reconciliation their peace, their re- you will reconcile, and we have the right to beat you, human. <laughs> what a sick... I mean, basically, I mean, the Nobel Peace Prize is just worthless. I mean, Obama got it. Or they, obviously, right? they jumped the shark with the Obama thing. <laughs> yeah, I know, but they, he's got into how many wars for peace? I mean, wars for peace. That. I mean, the word oxymoron just doesn't even quite fit. Wars for peace. But you, people say it, though, with a straight face. Oh, yeah. We, we, have, to, we have to go in there. We have to invade to prevent war. <laughs> we, we have to take them out before they attack us. We have to kill one and a half million Iraqis so no one dies there in Iraq. We have to kill a half a million children in Iraq through our peaceful embargo so we don't have to go in and kill one and a half million more. Oh. Whoops. Stop that. You're thinking. Do you remember when that was going on? Yeah. Nobody blinked an eye. Yep. Ron Paul did. You had... Um, he blinked real big. You had everybody, all the big wigs coming on and saying how it was necessary. Blah, 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 blah. You have... Uh, well, like Lou Rockwell mentioned, the uh, we have to shoot drone missiles at weddings because there's a bad guy there who cares if it kills 60 other people i mean we have to do that for peace and 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 it's a sacrifice i'm willing to make yes that's right and that's the greatest part we are so willing to sacrifice other people's lives that's pretty i mean we've had a guy that called here and said well no it's not it's pretty sick now we're getting ready to go into syria i mean oh Right. Well, the, and the United Nations has also made a call to send troops into Mali, too, which I don't know if anybody's ever looked at a globe lately. It's like, what on earth does another little tiny nation in Africa have to do with... Who do we need to kill there, I wonder? I wonder if they were trying to go off the American dollar. Ooh, no, petrodollar? No, no, That wouldn't have anything to do with it at all. I mean, the I was actually reading part of that Economics in One Lesson. And one of the chief aspects of that lesson is that you have to look at the long-term effects of every policy. What do you, what do you what is going to happen if you cause this to happen economically? Well, right, yeah, Ron Paul, his famous thing was the blowback thing. Yeah, and people still people ridicule him for that. Ha! Huh, they don't kill us because we killed two million of them. That's not why they hate us. They don't hate us because we blow up weddings and kill teenagers and all that. They hate us because we're free. They hate us because we're free. What a joke. No. You go and you blow up a bunch of people and kill some guy's family. He's not going to thank you for making them free. He's going to be pissed off and want to come kill you. And, we, and I know people I would. go, well... Yeah, I would too. Well, uh... You know, that's no excuse for why uh, Osama bin Laden hit the towers, even though he told us exactly why he did it. I mean, we, we believe everything he says when he says he wants to kill us and all that. But when he tells us why, we say, ha oh, that's not why. Well, he only wants to kill us because we're what, free. What was his reason why? Because yeah. we've been desecrating the Holy Land for them. Because we've been there killing them. Yeah. I, I mean, if you, one of the great things that I saw in uh, one of the Ron Paul campaign issues that that kind of started turning me toward Ron Paul. And I, I never got, I never drank the Ron Paul Kool-Aid. But right. uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed watching was a little video, of a flash uh, presentation that was put together that talked about if you could imagine what would happen if a foreign country came here within the boundaries of the United States, set up a military base, started bombing our people, and started patrolling our streets, how would we react to that military, to that military presence from some foreign country? There'd be a lot of basement bandits learning how to build IEDs, I'll tell you that much. I would hope so. I don't have much hope for the people here anymore. We'd probably just say, well, 
that's our God instituted government now, so we got to <laughs> obey it too. We better start learning Chinese. <laughs> we better start learning Chinese and uh, have a day when the churches uh, pray to elect a new communist leader. Now, what's funny is you have um, in Iraq, they were under a pretty oppressive government, obviously. <laughs> Saddam Hussein and his sons were pretty out of control. The same people that supported him were the same people that fought us, right? I, If we got invaded here, people would fight because they aren't mandated. We only allow tyranny on ourselves if we mandate it. Hmm. 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 I'm not sure. Let's take some calls. All right. 458-TALK is a number. All of our lines are on hold. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? We're on hold. Yeah. It's Brian. Brian, go ahead. I was listening to you guys talk about government, and uh, one of my favorite uh, bedtime reading books is the CIA World Factbook. Nice. Hmm. And uh, if, if you go in there, I've been scouring. I mean, I traveled the world for 30 years, went to many, many countries and hemispheres and continents, and the one thing I noticed is no matter where you went, there was always one thing, and that's government. Hmm. Now... I uh, I challenge my friends who are like-minded to tell me of a place where you can go that there is no government. And there's only one spot that actually qualifies as a sort of a nation in the world, and that's a, a place called Western Sahara. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, basically, uh, you know, along the west coast of uh, northern Africa there. And there's a there's been a fight going on between them and Morocco and a couple of other countries, but it's basically a big ashtray, and there's nothing there, a little bit of oil. But the rest of the places in the world that are unorganized are essentially little itty-bitty uh, atolls out in the Pacific or a little island off of the, you know, a thousand miles off the coast of Antarctica where there isn't anybody. Mm-hmm. But anywhere there's people, there's going to be government. There is. I think we're about to see an end of what we see right now as the nation states, though. I mean, it's a worldwide academic right, a- epidemic right now with the financial crisis. It's not just the United States. It's the European Union. It's, I mean, we're so, the world governments are so intertwined right now economically with the central banks all over the world. The economic collapse, I think, is going to see an end or maybe a readjustment of the world's nation states. I think it's going to be pretty interesting when that one happens. We'll see what comes out of it. I, uh, well, the, uh, the, it's interesting to watch what's going on in China now. The Chinese have had something on the order of 700,000 uprisings and protests and riots over the last, I guess it was hmm. eight, nine, ten years. <clears throat> the people there um, have access more and more to world media, and they're seeing how free these other places are and freedom has been increasing in in china but it's not going fast enough for the people there i don't think Mm -hmm. and the chinese government is scared to death that they're going to lose control and lose their power and so now they're for some reason all of a sudden they've decided the japanese are their enemies (laughs) and uh (laughs) sure you got to get patriotism back in the in the game yeah so they're going to start deflecting their people's anger you know to the government to towards the japanese much like we do to brown people <clears throat> yeah as long as they're not in our country uh you know brown people are fair game uh all over the world doesn't matter where they are and it's, you were talking about mali before i've been to northern mali i don't know why anybody would want <clears throat> at least that part of the country <laughs> they're being oppressed even, they're being oppressed <laughs> there's nothing there there's no people I mean, relatively speaking, you go to northern Mali, you got to fly around in a high-speed airplane for a long time before you see anything. It's not even sand. It's just hard ground, and there's nothing growing there, no water, no topography. You know, I mean, Mali is just a – it is an actual wasteland. There is no natural resources to speak of. Uh, I don't know why we would want to go over there and do anything. I don't remember what – the acronym is for it, but I've been reading some stuff and talking to some friends that are in military and ex-military that were, you know, not just your regular guy that was uh, 
vol- you know, they were officers and they're involved in some pretty interesting things. And they have told me that Africa is the next place to go. Once the Middle East, Af- we've already got our sights on Africa. Well, the Chinese really own Africa now. I mean, they're they're putting up Chinese villages. They're bringing in Chinese workers. They're teaching the local indigenous populations on many dozen countries over there are are pretty much been bought lock and stock and barrel uh, by the the Chinese so I think we're you know we're a little late to the game here uh, they are well entrenched over there and that's what their you know their expansionist policy is to, to go anywhere where they can get resources cheap I think they have uh, I think they've learned it's a lot cheaper to go in and influence people and buy people out than it is to militarily take them over mm-hmm I don't really think that, uh, I mean, this is just my, my dumb, dummy opinion, but I just, uh, you look at where they're going. You know, they're going after all these islands, the Spratleys, and over in the Philippines, they're taking over stuff, and they're doing everything they can um, to do it without force. They're just coming in and saying, well, here's some money, uh, you know, here's some goodies, uh, bread and circuits, this kind of stuff, And uh, but we were going to go over here and cut your trees down or uh, take your gold out of the ground. Yeah, they're spending heavily in uh, South America, too. I was reading a story not too long ago. They invested some over $2 billion in, uh, I don't know what the highway is called. Basically, there's a huge highway being built to interconnect South American countries. Just a big infrastructure job, and they've invested over $2 billion this year in that. Which, yeah, well, they're working uh, on the Pan American Highway, which really doesn't connect. Was- I think that's what they want to do is up there in northern uh, Colombia, there's a big swampy area where the, the northern section of the Pan American Highway stops, and you got to get on a barge or a ship and go around, and I think it's about a, it's called the Darien Gap, and uh, they want to they wanna connect that all up, and it's going to be a massive, massive project so that they can drive their stuff, their product all the way on the same container on the back of a truck all the way from Tierra de Fuego to Alaska if they want to. Hmm. Anyway, I just wanted to put that in there. Thanks for the call. Yeah, Appreciate it. Yeah, good call. Thank you. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's on our phone? Hello? Hello? Hey, who is this? Ah, oh, this is me. This is Rita. <laughs> Rita, go ahead. Interesting show. I think if you look at the big picture, you'll see you've got a small group of people controlling everything. But what I'd like to go is bring us a little bit closer to home. I went... Uh, to the federal auction on uh, for closed properties on Thursday. Mm-hmm. There's one way to get a foreclosed uh, IRS foreclosed property on uh, on a stay is by filing bankruptcy, which is what Vernon's did. I checked Pacer and made sure they filed uh, Friday, and it was posted on Pacer. But just and whatever, I went over, and sure enough, here were two, um, <clears throat> I take it, IRS agents and uh, five uh, federal agents, and uh, I asked if I could see the paperwork on the properties that were going to be auctioned off, and they handed me one, which was Vernon's. So I took a look at him, and uh, I asked, I said, that is not a bankruptcy stay, the proceedings. And uh, one of the ladies just looked. She said, oh, do you have the paperwork on that? I said, no. I said, I just happened to see it on Pacer. I said, you're the one who's supposed to know all of these things. So she got on the telephone, and... um, made a number of calls that uh, they canceled to the auction. Somebody had to have known that. I wonder if it was, well, they're in jail and there's nothing they can do about it and we'll just get rid of it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I read that in the paper here the other day. They, it was stopped from bankruptcy. And then bankruptcy judge, it looks like, is going to have the final say on whether he's going to allow the sale or not, which... Uh, yeah, but Josh, uh, if I hadn't gone in and said something, they would have sold it right then and there. Oh, I'm sure. And not only that, their case is still at the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit has not even ruled on it yet. So it should never have gone this far in the first place. 
They they challenged the power, though. I mean, they they were out there advocating for the sovereign citizen point of view of saying that the the government doesn't have the right to tax them. I mean, they directly challenged the Leviathan. Well, you know, I haven't read all of uh, all of their uh, filings and pleadings, so I don't know what all there was. But uh, you know that that's another story on uh, just who is required and who has the right to do what. But I mean, it's just to show that uh, you know the powers that be don't go by the laws; they don't go by the rules. No, they make the laws and they make the rules and they get to change them as they I mean, go. Right, they get to change them. <laughs> yeah. And. It, Anyway, thank you for the program. Right, thanks All right, for thanks the call. Four five eight talk is the number. You've got it on Patriots Lament. Who's this? Are you still there? Good morning. This is Marco. Good morning, Marco. What's on your mind? Yeah, hi. I uh, I remember about uh, well, twelve and fourteen years ago, two rotations in Kuwait. And one of them, I was wiping my sweat off at Camp Doha, and I looked up and I saw a British truck drive by with air conditioning, and I thought, you know. Uh, that would be nice. And then I I remembered I saw Australian, I saw Dutch, I saw the British, I saw the Japanese, and they were all over there helping to liberate the the country of its resources, and I thought that was very (laughs) cool. Hmm. Or did I say that right? No, I think you did. We're exporting democracy by liberating countries of their resources. (laughs) That's that's an excellent way of putting it, Marco. You know, and, and... at the time, I was active duty, and my rationale was, well, if I'm not here, somebody else is, is going to be here, uh, country-wise. And, uh, you know, I, I thought the United States, we had, uh, we, as the most powerful nation in the world, we had a lot of responsibilities and pressures uh, put to bear on us, and uh it's only in in more recent years after I've retired that I've had time to reflect on uh, the more insidious aspects. Mm-hmm. Marco, what country was this again? Uh, Kuwait. Kuwait. All right. So it must have been during the uh, after the first Iraq War. We were over there. Yeah, I was there with the first Cav uh, in the late nineties and the turn of the century. Hmm. Right. So were you out before the war started there then? I had knee surgery, so uh, I couldn't go. Hmm. I bet you wanted to. You know, the second war, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I loved what I did. I was a medic, and the first war, I was actually nervous walking in and volunteering, but I couldn't stand the idea of my junior medics deploying and me staying back. But my OIC of my clinic said, "You're not going anywhere." And the second war, I just, uh, I just had a, a lot of distractions, and uh, you know, in retrospect, I, uh, I, you know, it was really hard for me to see uh, anybody come back with a piece of shrapnel or the the, the brutality that uh, the IEDs invoked on us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh... You know, it's amazing that we've war has been so publicized now. I mean, there's cameras, you get to see the action right up front and everything. And, and yet, at the same time, we're so eager to go to war, even though we know that we're sending teenagers, real young men, to go get limbs blown off. And women, too. Now. And women, yeah, to get limbs blown off. And it's just, we don't take going to war serious enough. I mean, we are just way too eager to go ruin someone else's lives while we sit back and watch it on TV and cheer our side on like it's a stinking football game. It's almost like the atmosphere immediately preceding the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And in the first few battles, you had crowds of civilians coming out onto the hills to watch the battle. Right. Yeah, they actually set up their chairs and lawn chairs and had picnics and like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, I think that I think every nation, the government is controlled by uh, people who I can do without. <laughs> but conversely, uh, when I was in Egypt, you know, when I was uh, in the Philippines, the everyday man in every country is just trying to feed his mm-hmm. family and do the right thing. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Very interesting. 
All the more reason to go and kill them, my friend. Uh, Obviously a threat to the very existence of democracy and freedom. I was glad I was a medic. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. No. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I really, and I saw the innocence, you know, being, uh, you know, exploited and perverted, and uh, and and and, and uh, you know, I know sometimes war is justified, but unnecessary war is a horrendous cost to the people at my level even though it may result in generational income to the International Bank of Settlements and to uh, the Federal Reserve, to the corporate CEOs, it's done at a horrible expense. Yeah, a human cost. Yeah. Well, I, the, but, if, if you think of the humans, though, as just one more resource to be exploited, then... Think, think about if we hadn't jumped into the wars that we're in, though, and kept our dollar propped up, a petrodollar... Would we be able to exist right now? If we did keep it propped up? No, if we, if we, we had If we hadn't oh. engaged in um, any nation that was trying to trade in the um, the gold, what is it called, the denarii? Not sure. I don't know. Would we be able to hold on to what we have now? Would our economy have collapsed by now? What do we if, have now? If we were uh, truly controlled by patriotic Americans at the very top, I think that would be the uh, where the rubber meets the road. If they've gone global and become insensitive to Americans and treating treating us like a colony, yeah. then we're yeah. out of time. Thanks very much for the phone call, and welcome back to Patriots Amend right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio. I am Steve Floyd here to push the buttons and uh, maybe push your buttons too a little bit. Uh, In the studio, Josh Bennett from, uh, I'm not sure, oh yeah, Bighorn Enterprises, and Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. We never get never get tired of that song. Um, one of the last things that caller was saying was that if the country was controlled at the very top by patriotic Americans, is that the problem? Is it the people at the very top that's the problem? If we got if we got new people at the top, would that make a difference? That's basically, and I don't want to jump on the guy because he's not on the radio, and I don't think he's not on now, so I don't, I don't think he's necessarily saying this for, for sure. But basically, we need a political answer. Would having patriotic, quote unquote, Americans at the top change anything? I don't even know what that means. At the top of what, and to do what? I mean. Would they get rid of the national banks? Would they get rid of fiat currencies? Could they? Could central banks be stopped from making it possible for our governments to go to war nonstop for eternity because they can just borrow the money, borrow the money, borrow the money? Which is why we had to get off the gold standard for what? World War Two or one? All of them, we had to do it, Lincoln had to do it when he wanted to fight the Civil War. I mean, our currency, our money, supposed money, what we're forced to use as money is such a huge problem with everything, almost every problem. We can go back to say, well, if the, if the government didn't have the ability to borrow money at will, for eternity, however much they want to borrow, then they wouldn't be able to do the things that they're doing now. I mean, if you have a credit card that's doesn't have any end to it, you know, what, what's your hunting season going to be like? <laughs> if you just got 50 bucks in your pocket, you're going to put three gallons of gas in your car and buy uh, an MRE, hopefully, well, no, you're already out of money. I'm gonna say maybe a box of shells. You already got the shells and the gun, so you're you're that far ahead. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go up the Steese Highway till you're almost out of gas and turn around and come back. That's gonna be the hunting season. If you got 50 bucks, if you got a credit card that says you can go wherever you want, it's you don't have a limit on this thing. You're gonna go wherever you want to go, and you're I'm gonna, gonna keep charter going. a flight exactly and, and uh, rent some a, a raft to float down. No, you don't have to. You buy the plane to charter yourself oh, in. You yeah. hire a guy to fly you in there. 
he picks you up and sets you down in the raft that you bought, and you have three guys rowing for you. And then uh, someone else calls that bull in, and the bull, you already bought him, too. So he comes marching in and says, all right, kill me. The best part is you pay a guy to shoot him for you. You don't <laughs> even go. You just hang it on your wall. Mm, I don't like the shooting part. I wanted to get to that part. So the big 70-inch bull walks up, and you shoot him. They go clean him out. Don't. I mean, that's kind of a dumb analogy, but it's true. It's the difference between having an unlimited credit card and having something that controls your spending. So you're saying we just need to be fiscally responsible. No. That's why we not, need to vote in Mitt Romney. Not fiscally responsible. But we need to change the, other issue, the monetary system. The other issue, period. too, though, besides the monetary system, Josh, is that where does that credit card come from? You're basically financing the paying back of that credit card by stealing from people. Yeah, we pointed out here a while back, you know, when you hear politicians say, we're stealing from our children. No. The French and Indian War is still being paid for. The Nine Years' War, as the English call them, still being paid for by the English people on taxes. They never paid that war off. They just made the payment for their interest. So that's been almost 300 years. So it's not just their children that paid for that war. Their children's 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 children are going to pay for it. That war is never going to be paid off, which is great for banks, which is great for governments. But it really sucks when you're the guy that's getting your money stolen from you every year to pay for those things. What are we still paying on today? I mean, our tax money, what is it just, are we just now paying for the Iraq war? No. Our tax money is going to pay for things that are 100 years old still that we owe money on. It'll never stop. It'll never stop. And look into the future. We're $200 trillion in debt and obligations. And we're running at a deficit of a trillion dollars. A year. Which means that we are spending a trillion more than we're taking in every single year. How can how could a household do that? I mean, if you just take away all those zeros. <laughs> if you're spending $1,000 more every month than you're taking in, how long can you go on in the household? Fiscal year 2013, the government spent more money the first day of fiscal year 2013. Spent more debt, I should say that. Had more debt on the first day of fiscal year 2013 than the United States government accrued from 1776 to 1947. That's including the wars. World War Two, World War One, Mexican Wars, the you know, is everything. That, is that Obama's fault? Yeah, absolutely it's not. Oh, no. <laughs> right. It, it's not, and and that's one of the things that I, I'm I'm trying to in that impress upon. So some you're of saying my... it's George Bush's fault? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's our fault. It's our fault because we keep going and voting in the same thing, thinking that we're going to make political change, but the system will not change. It's not going to change. Your voting isn't going to change squat. Sorry to pull the air out of the balloon, burst the bubble, however you want to put it. It's not going to happen. There are more effectual ways for you to make change in this country, to make change in your neighborhood, to make change in your borough, to make change in your city. It's not voting. Well, and you know what? More people than I know about get... Uh, people get really wrapped around the axle about politics. They, they have an, a loss... Of personal peace. People have got really well, ticked at you yeah, when you said you're going to vote. Yeah. I mean, people call up Michael Duke's vote. show and say, whew, whew, that idiot needs to get taken off the air. Exactly. You need to be taken. Think about how. So your right to not vote, your right to free speech, all these things, you should be taken off the air. That's how horrible it is mm -hmm. to them that you decided not to participate so much so that basically if they could i think they'd throw you in a cage the last two elections now the primary in august and then the borough election here in october i did not vote and you know what happened to me i ostracized you know, well that 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 was uh that was kind of an, one of those long-term effects which honestly the people that don't want to hang out with me because i don't do what they tell me to do. I don't, I don't really want to hang out with them anyway. Totally different reasons. Uh, You're well, better off without them anyway. No, no. But the the thing that the thing is is that on the on election night, I had more peace, I had more calm, I slept better than in any previous election nights 
in my entire adult life. Uh, so Lou Rockwell pointed out that that's um, by and large the effect that that has on everybody. Yeah, your voting isn't going to change uh, Lonnie Vernon from getting his house taken away from the IRS. Right, exactly. Rita that called in, her and her husband just lost their house from the taxes, from the IRS. You're they're, voting. They're in their it? 80s. Yeah. A home that they had for 35 years or something, 30-some years, taken. Everything they worked for is taken from a piece of crap government and its officials because, well, we've given them the consent to do it. No one stand up and saying that's wrong. No, they're saying, well, we need to vote some. We need to vote in Mitt Romney. Why? Because he's going to stop homes being taken away from Americans because they don't pay their taxes. Do we not understand how sick that is? I mean, that is sickening. It's disgusting that in the land of the free and the home of the brave, which is really the the land of the fee and home of the slaves. Oh, nice. <laughs> that the government can take your home because you didn't pay them what they said. What they think is required for them, how much you, they think you should pay them for the service that they decide on how much to give you. That's sickening. We didn't have a revolution, so the government could take your property. And people, instead of getting upset about it and stopping it from happening, people just go down and they go to the auctions and they buy the tax. The tax they go to the tax auctions and they buy the homes. And they think, huh, well, those idiots... Who do they think they were not paying their taxes? Everyone needs to pay their fair share. That's how perverted we are. That's why this country is going down, and we deserve it. Glenn Beck uh, pointed out on his show, for all the people that think that we're just crazy, he had a little special segment uh, talking about how much a person actually pays, and he went, included state taxes, and, of course, we're exempt from some of those in Alaska, but, you know, he was obviously basing it lower 48, state taxes and FICA, medical, all that kind of stuff, and uh, income tax. Uh, the average person pays 56% was his uh, number that he came up with. 56% of their income goes to government one way or another. And we get and, taught in... And, well, the, just the insane part is he used that as the reason we should vote for Mitt Romney. <laughs> and we get taught in schools from our government that... The first revolution started for uh, over taxes of being uh, no representation. Well, they don't teach it anymore, but, you know, what we get told is no representation without taxation. And, uh, it was the other way around. Or, yeah, <laughs> taxation with no representation. Either. No, that's what we have now. Exactly. And that's what they're griping about. So what? they're getting taxed at a rate of about 3%. And they were upset they were because ticked. it was too high. They were getting taxed a hundred years earlier at a rate to the equivalent of about a dollar per hundred thousand of what your land was worth. Well, and look at how how efficient our government has been in inculcating that belief that somehow it's our patriotic duty to surrender our income, so that people will turn around and report their neighbors for not not telling you know hey he didn't report his full income. And, and we think that somehow we have to report our full income or else we are cheating the government. Oh, you're cheating your neighbor. Well, how many people here in the borough, you think about the property taxes, how many people report the improvements they do to their homes? Because aren't you being unpatriotic by not letting them tax you at the full value that they say your house should be worth? Yeah. How many people keep tarps up on their roof because it brings down the value of their house? How many people put junk out or, or let junk accumulate in their yard? They're thieves, Steve. Because if, you go, if you go to England, they're there's thieves. homes that are two, three hundred years old that still don't have siding on them because they go by the same property tax uh, laws that we do. So there's 300-year-old homes in downtown London that don't have siding on the front. The people of them. are thieves. They're yeah, not they're paying stealing from the English shares. government. They're stealing from no the people. The reason and we and right jump here in the on it because too, it's, yeah. not, it's not just that they're stealing from the government. Who's the government? It's us. We're the government. Yeah, we're they're the government. stealing from us. Yeah, that's Maria why. and her Maria husband didn't they pay their taxes. They stole from me. Exactly. I'm glad they got their house taken. Yeah. Now they can go down and get a state voucher because they're 80 years old and get an even nicer place that we'll all pay for. That the state stole from someone else? No, the money oh, that the wow. state got. All right. Yeah, we don't agree with it at all. It's horrible. It's wrong. That's why I say this this country deserves what it's going to get. Because people, lo- they clap. Ha! Huh. You read your stupid daily news minus. 
You know, when, you when know stories like that come on there, people write comments on there saying, well, good, they deserve to have their home taken. They deserve to have their whole life destroyed. What? After the IRS takes the house and sells it, the person still owes the tax. Exactly. That's the funniest part of all. <laughs> okay, it's not funny. Let's take the phone call. 458 Talk oh. is a number. Are you still there, caller? Yes. Who is this? This is Cecily. Cecily, thanks for calling in. What's on your mind? Well, this is the, about 40 minutes I waited for it. And I forgot what I was going to say. No, actually, nice. um, um, the truth is usually has three stages. It's um, First it's ridiculed, and then it's violently opposed, and then it is uh, accepted as normal, natural, every day. Um, then also the, the we have a lot of karma to pay for having um, raped and pillaged every country in the world. And so it, you know, as far as what goes around comes around. And the, then um, the uh, Chinese uh, have a, a way that if you put inside of you all that you look for, that you want to find in love, um, you know, make a list of all those things and then be all those things and you will draw those things to you like a magnet. So in order that you would want integrity all uh, around and about you, you would walk in that same thing, in, in, in that integrity. So it, it, then when you look about in your world, that's what you would see as far as there, the the evil. If to fight it, it draws you in there, and then you have that same energy in you. Whereas if you put inside yourself all that you want your world to be, that is the the overriding um, reality that you would have. A friend of of ours, uh, Josh Luther, who I won't say where he went, but he's left the town. He's left the our the town. town. Mm-hmm. His uh, the bottom of his emails he always signs off with "Be the change you want to see in the world." Aaron Burr. Hmm. That's exactly right. Thanks for the call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, good morning, Frank Kearney here. Hi, Frank. Frank. Hey, I really appreciate the Lou uh, Rockwell. Is that his name, Rockwell? Yeah. Excuse me. Well, we got to play that again. That was awesome. Uh, I have two quotes here I'd like to share up on my wall. Yeah. Uh, government cannot grant you a thing. It can only limit on on the place which was rightfully yours to begin with. And the other one is really hit. What? To be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law-driven, numbered, and regulated. I'm not going for this so-called quota in the city. I'm not buying into the fact that this is just a safety issue. When I listen to the chief, he says uh, police officers have to have probable cause. Well, if the chief did his homework, you could see since the Patriot Act, they changed the language. Now it's reasonable suspicion. What's reasonable to the cop today? And as far as pulling you over without cause, he can make up anything. He can fabricate, distort, and lie anything on his uh, complaint form the time you get to the court. And one other thing I want to point out, I, I like Vivian Stiver, but... She says, well, if you have a complaint to a police officer, come to me. It don't work where it work that way, Vivian. You have to uh, fill out a complaint form. Then you've got all kinds of hoops of intimidation you have to go through. The only way, and it's all an internal affair. She can't do nothing. The only way you can get these guys is take them to civil court. And you know what that costs is to get anything out of these police. So uh, these quotas have been deemed, I don't care, all, all the number of games the chief wants to use. They've been deemed by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. Thank you, and great show. Thanks, Thanks for the call. Four five eight talk the number. Moving on. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hi. Hi. Who is this? This is Mary. I thought I'd like to call in and and uh, let people know if you want change, it's going to take a lot of people to change it. You take about three hundred and fifty hundred people or two million people marching down the streets that we're not going to pay these taxes anymore. That'll work. But as long as you keep paying them. This is what we're going to keep getting. We're going to get more taxes and more taxes, and neither one of those guys, uh, Obama or Mitt Romney, are going to change anything. They never have. It took years to get us in the condition that we're in right now, and the only way for change is about 2 million people marching down the streets saying we're not going to pay these taxes anymore. Do you think that that uh, could be affected on a much smaller scale if somebody like... um um, 
the the gal that called in her home's being taken that they've owned for 35 some odd years and they're 80 years old and getting put out literally on the street if the people locally would stand up and say that's not going to happen We're that's right up with it that's well, happening that's right it's take hap- about 300,000 people i don't think it needs to be 300,000 people i think if just 100 people showed up there they would we know instances when we were in idaho when we used to live there there was a uh, sheriff Hawaii County, the guy was awesome. And when the IRS would come to foreclose someone's house, he'd go right over and say, get out of my county or I'm going to arrest you. And it worked. So wow. they would uh, jump up and just leave. They were so scared of him because they they pushed him a few times. Just like he said, there will be no federal officers in my county with a weapon. Well, BLM, those guys, they'd come on there and they'd just walk around. He'd just arrest them. He'd throw him in jail and say, nope, not going to happen. And he had the support of the people. Mm-hmm. And those people, unfortunately, I, I'm sure that 99.9% of them still paid their taxes, even though they had a guy there mm-hmm. that would protect them from it. But you're right. It, two million people would be sweet, but right here in this town, and I'm one to blame, too. I wasn't down there protesting or telling the IRS, no, you're not taking Rita's home. And we're all to blame for that. But if 300 people went down there and said no... This is their home. You have no right. No, I don't care what right you s- claim to make up. And you got to you got to be willing to to get fire hosed in the process. I mean, you're right. You, exactly. You, you, you look but at that's what, what it in, takes. You know, exactly. I mean, that's what it takes. You have I mean, to be we've willing. We've let them go too far on this. You have to be willing to die, actually. Well, that's what it might take. It's going to take some real men that will do this. And it's going to take a lot more than a hundred people because we got a lot of officers. We got the army base. I mean, we have to start standing up, and voting is not going to solve these problems. Yep. They're just going to keep getting worse. People's homes are going to be taken, and that's just the way it is until people start standing up. We need a really huge militia is what we need. Well, I, and I think I, I would like for people to, uh, to join militias. They should. I don't have a problem with them either. Militias tend to digress into the very thing that you despise. Yeah, you you know, have a power structure, and the person on the top tends yeah, to... Yeah, that's the only problem I've seen with them is that they've digressed to, okay, I'm the, I'm the PowerPoint now, and I'm going to rule this thing when it's over. But it doesn't have to turn into that. It doesn't have to be an organized thing. It's just people need to be willing to live free or die, mm-hmm. because death is not the worst of evils. No, it and, isn't. We were not there yet. I'm not there yet. I don't want no, they, to die. There's three stages to revolution, and first is in the hearts and minds, and second is peaceful protest, um, and then the third, obviously, is um, violence. But usually, if the first two are given their due diligence, the third one never comes about. Well, look at, look at I mean, even look at our American Revolution. It began with those pamphlets going around, that whole common sense thing. Yeah. Right. You know, and then you had the, the protests. You had the Boston Tea Party. And you had the Boston Massacre. You remember what happened there? There yeah. was a, a group of people that turned out en masse to protest against the British, and the British, to break up the protest, opened fire. Killed five people? Five. Mm-hmm. And that became known as a Boston Massacre. And as the word went around the colonies, it that effect in those five people who whose lives were taken from them by the British, they ended up help being a catalyst to, to help to push the whole country, or what would become the country. Interesting right. that John Adams, I mean, this is way aside here, John well, Adams actually got them Well, the problem is, if you keep feeding them, off. what's the difference in voting? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... No, uh, go ahead, say that again. If you keep feeding uh, the monster, it's going to keep getting bigger. It's not going to get smaller, it's going to get bigger. Yeah, that's what Lou Rockwell's point was when, when he was on the show with us. It's not... The change is not giving them the consent. No, you may not do this. I won't be a part of this anymore. As long as you're going to be a part of it, then you get what you deserve. Quit griping about it. You said you'd participate with it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You don't have a, if you don't participate, you don't have a right to complain. Well, if we just sit and, you know, love everybody, like the one caller was talking about, that, that isn't going to change anything. Those people that lost their house, you know. We can love them, but they don't have their house. You know, it may not it may not change it for the individual who lost their house, but it's going to change. It may end up changing the mind of the person who's taken their house from them. Wow. Well, well, I mean, the, and that's one of the things that I you have to keep. I think people should be doing a lot more talking with these people that come to get the houses. You know, they could that, refuse to take the house from the people. That's why the Liberty Bell was brilliant. It's. Um, it, most people identify the Liberty Bell with Schaefer Cox, which he's actually not the author and writer of that. Another gentleman made that, and he kind of hijacked it. 
that was a wonderful thing that could have been uh that should have and could have been a great thing for this area. I wish that uh, had no one away. Well, where's all the people to back him up? I mean, there was nobody killed. I mean, people have to keep that in mind. Nobody was killed. I haven't kept up with that story. I don't know how long he got in prison. He hasn't been sentenced yet, but even Michael uh, Anderson, he was uh, a let go. I mean, people already throw him under the bus. Just a few friends of his, just a few of his close friends said, no, this is wrong. Everyone else in this valley basically was ready to throw him under the bus because, well, the government said he did it, so he must have done it. They wouldn't have something. arrested him if he hadn't done something wrong. Right. They let him go and said, oh, yeah, we uh, yeah. we can't do that. And uh, But the guy didn't kill anyone. He doesn't deserve 60 years in prison or 100 years or whatever they're going to give him. I'm sure it's going to be a long time. No, There's he no does, death. He doesn't deserve to be in jail at all. But the no, fact of the matter is Leviathan, when you threaten it, it's going to strike. Mm -hmm. You're going down, and they're going to make sure that you go down so that the rest of the sheep out there will go, oh, well, we'll obey. Right. Yeah, and that's what they've been doing. Think, the think about this, though. doesn't exist. Huh, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. It doesn't exist. Yeah. That's nonsense. One of the things that we've mentioned on this show before, and Aaron, you, you've brought this up a number of times. How many people did Hitler personally kill? Zero. Right. But he got the people all worked up. Through his words. Sure. I mean, yeah, um, words are powerful. I don't think Mao personally killed anybody either. Right. I mean, so uh, I mean, you Stalin, at, there's no record of Stalin personally killing so I'm, anybody. I'm not, I'm not ready to go and throw open the door for Schaefer Cox just yet. I mean, he did have a jury trial, did he not? Yeah, I was there. He had a jury trial. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to go throw open the door for, for Schaefer Cox because I heard words coming out of his mouth that were definitely violent words. And that were definitely aggressive words. You talk about non-aggressive, using violence only for defense. Well, that's right. a, that, and that, that I think is quite acceptable, and I think that's even justifiable uh, from I think most world religions. Yeah. But but the kind of language that comes from some of these people that talk about changing our country by violence, it's not is not good. All right, but the point I've tried to make a bunch of times is isn't every I mean, not everybody, obviously, but there's a huge percentage that are just as guilty as Schaefer Cox. Yeah, absolutely. The first thing out of their mouth is, well, when this catalyst happens, I'm going to just go nuts and shoot every direction. And that's pretty much the, the consensus among so-called patriotic Americans is forget about standing up for anything now because I have this end state that when I finally get to it, I'm just going to throw lead everywhere. I'm going to keep buying guns and more guns and more guns. I can't even carry all my guns. I'm going to look like a hodgepodge of <laughs> porcupine ridiculousness with all my guns. And, Quit making uh, fun of me. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine uh, just reminded me to go back to the Etienne de la Buete, what we started out with, what yeah. Lou Rocco brought up. How can they step on us if we do not give them the feet? How can they pick our pockets if we don't give them the fingers? It's us. We're the ones that do it. We're the ones that stole Rita's house. We're the ones that locked up Vernon's and Schaefer and Michael Anderson. To that end, we are the government. Thanks oh, for the call. We're out of time. Thank you very much. PatriotsLament.blogspot.com or uh, Radio... Web Radio Free Fairbanks on the YouTube, Patriots Lament at gmail.com. And then I think we have a Facebook coming soon. No. Outstanding. Check us out and uh, listen again next week. Also, this show will be posted on the KFAR website yeah, Robert on Murphy Monday. Next week. See you next week.